Hello and welcome to this presentation on demystifying modulation. My name is Jason Tranter and I am the founder and managing director of Mobius Institute. In this presentation we're going to look at modulation, amplitude and frequency modulation, and we're going to look at some common fault conditions that cause modulation in gears, bearings, electric motors, and might mention some others. Um, I'm going to attempt to uh, uh, clarify what the difference is between amplitude modulation and beating and clarify what the difference is in between modulation frequency and amplitude modulation that we see in machines and the demodulation technique used in enveloping and so on. They might seem like they're related but they're actually not. The reason for this presentation is I did one uh, recently in a webinar that was related to gearbox vibration and quite a few questions came up afterwards uh, related to these topics. So I thought, well, there's a good opportunity to try and clarify some of those points. Anyway, let's start with the real basics. Here we have a simple sine wave which when we do an FFT produces a single spectrum a single peak in the spectrum I should say. You notice that each one of these is a cycle. We've got 20 cycles per second but the amplitude of each cycle is the same. It rises and falls by the same amount each time and that's generally what we expect to see. If the machine was out of balance then I get some rise and fall in vibration. We get one peak in the spectrum and all is good. But what happens with amplitude and frequency modulation? Well, let's look at this case again and, and what I'm going to do is just bump that up to 50 Hertz and I'll just bump this amplitude down just a little bit, just makes it easier to see what I'm about to talk about. Um, so again we have the situation, one peak in the spectrum, uh, one source of vibration if that's the signal that we're looking at. Now if I just uh, add another signal to this and it has a whatever the frequency of that signal is and we'll give it some amplitude as well. Um, what we've got right now are two signals. We had our 50 Hertz signal plus this 4 Hertz signal. There's therefore two peaks in the spectrum and hey, our time waveform takes on a certain shape. You notice that both halves are rise, fall, rise, fall. And we could play around with these signals and show what happens when you simply add two signals together. But the waveform will change a certain way, the spectrum will change a certain way. But this is not modulation. This is simple addition of signals. What I'm going to do now is change what's happening with this little simulator so that it is performing amplitude modulation. What's happening now is I've got my 50 hertz signal, which is this one in here, but I am modulating that signal by this one, which is 4 hertz and an amplitude of 2. This one was 50 hertz and an amplitude of 5. Don't worry about the units on the amplitude, it's just arbitrary. So what we see now is that the signal itself rises. So if you look at this portion here, it looks like a higher amplitude 50 hertz signal than here. And that's actually what's happening. It rises in amplitude, falls in amplitude, rises in amplitude, falls in amplitude. This periodic change in the signal characteristic, which in this case is the amplitude uh, that's changing, uh, is called modulation. And in this case, because it's the amplitude changing, it's called amplitude modulation. Uh, with radios, there's FM radios and AM radios, this is the technique with AAM. This was our high frequency carrier signal, the one in here, which is the frequency you dial into on the radio dial and superimposed on top in this case is just one frequency and one amplitude, but in actual fact in the old days when AM, well AM still used now, but that would be the voice signal, the voice and music and whatever's coming over the radio was superimposed over the carrier that was used to transmit it from you know, the radio station out to the towers and whatever. Anyway, without going into all the detail, the amplitude signal, the amplitude of the signal varies. In this case it is varying four times a second, four hertz. So if if I could if I had a sine wave which looked exactly like that, 
it would be a 4 hertz signal with an amplitude of 2. In fact, I can say, show me the two signals, and you can see, you can just hopefully see in there, the orange is the sort of carrier signal, it's the signal that I'm modulating, and it's a bit hard to see, but in here is the green, this is the modulating signal. Um, there's just the, the combination of the two. Now while I'm doing all this, if I increase the frequency, we see the the rate at which it rises and falls is now five times a second, so they're sort of bunching together. We can change the amplitude as well. Down below is the spectrum, and notice I do not have a peak in the spectrum at uh, five hertz with an amplitude of two. It's not to say when you do vibration analysis there wouldn't that there wouldn't be such a peak, but with pure amplitude modulation, I'm not seeing that peak at all. This isn't something funny I'm doing in the software. This is true. You know, I'm modulating the signals and I'm doing the FFT. What we have here is the center peak, which is related to this one. So it's at 50 hertz and has an amplitude of 5. If I increase the amplitude, you can see how the waveform changes and you can see how the spectrum changes. But I've got these little peaks on either side they are called sidebands. The separation between this center peak, which is also called the center frequency, and the sidebands is 5 Hz. So we've got 50, therefore this peak is at 55 and this one's at 45. With pure amplitude modulation I just get one peak on either side. But notice that if I increase the amplitude of the modulating signal, the sidebands go up. And I notice the time waveform starts to look a little bit odd, but um, same way if I increase this, uh, the carrier signal, then sure enough the center peak goes up. And if we played around, I could make the center peak completely go away and just have sideband peaks. In reality, we can have a situation, a little bit hard to explain quickly, but you get sort of this uh, uh, addition and cancellation of signals such that the sideband amplitudes aren't the same. We can get a little sideband peak on this side and a much bigger sideband peak on this side. In fact, you might see situations with electric motors where you have a peak at the rotor bar frequency um, and on either side of that is a peak at twice line frequency. So it'll be separated by 100 hertz or 120 hertz. But you may have a situation where the peak at the rotor bar pass frequency is not all that high in amplitude the peak at that frequency minus twice line frequency is maybe quite small, but the amplitude of the peak at rotor bar passing frequency plus twice line frequency is actually quite high in amplitude, and in fact it might dominate that part of the spectrum. So when you look at it, you might see a peak and think, wow, it's not an integer multiple of running speed, I don't know what it is. But you might find that if you subtracted twice line frequency, that there might be a small peak in the spectrum and that would be an integer multiple of running speed. It would be the number of rotor bars. Anyway, so we can see various combinations of these sorts of things which we'll explore a little bit in just a second. So that is amplitude modulation and shortly I'll just summarize a few things regarding the sidebands. Now we're going to take a look at frequency modulation. In this case we see we're back to our 20 Hertz amplitude Eight. And we've already seen that if I add a signal of just, you know, a low frequency, you know, whatever amplitude, um, you know, we've already been through this process, it changes the waveforms in a certain way. But watch what happens when I say, let's modulate the frequency of our original signal. Instead of the amplitude rising and, and falling, the frequency of the signal changes. Notice if you just look here, it looks like a low frequency signal. Here it looks like a higher frequency signal. So the frequency itself rises, falls, r rises, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. Increases, decreases. I think that's the word I'm looking for. Um, uh, now, I'm exaggerating the amount of modulation. In, in actual case with rotating machinery, this is more common than you may think. But what's actually happening is there's a slight variation in the speed of the machine. So in a moment you'll see that you know as gears mesh together, um, we 
can see, if there's any eccentricity or whatever, we can see some amplitude modulation. But as those teeth mesh together, we can have a slight sort of slowdown and then a return to the proper speed. A slight slowdown, a return to the proper speed. So we get this variation in speed, which is therefore variation in the frequency. It's a periodic motion as each tooth comes into mesh, and we can see therefore a variation. We can see it occurring uh, more so at some points in the rotation than at other points and therefore once per revolution the machine can appear to change speed. Either way, even though this looks quite strange down here, we see um, lots of sidebands. So if I just change um, these, these parameters here I just make some changes anyway. We can sort of play around with this. There's just lots of sidebands in here, and just depending on the actual settings and so on, we get a real variety of these sidebands, which are separated by this frequency here. It's separated by that, and you can see how that's changing. But we get these funny cancellations and so on. Um, without dragging on about this too much, basically you see that it's generating lots of sidebands and that's why with machinery there's a few other reasons I won't go into but we see uh, more sidebands than just the one on either side that I demonstrated with pure amplitude modulation. So when we do our analysis with the spectra we can see all sorts of things. We can see you know sidebands appearing around 1x and maybe 2x and maybe 1x and 2x and maybe a gear mesh frequency maybe a bearing frequency uh, the separation you know this actual sideband frequency as we'll see in a moment could be uh, 1x vibration it could be equal to the fundamental train frequency it could be uh, equal to the pole pass frequency various types of separation so we get you know different carriers depending on what sort of machine and component we're looking at the separation according to the fault we can have harmonics and those harmonics can have sidebands we can have just one sideband on either side we get lots of sidebands on either side and there's variations in amplitude so basically we have the center frequency the sidebands and there's a certain separation uh, which is you know equal on either side and as I say we can see some sort of harmonics and each of those harmonics might even have sidebands. You'll see a real life case of that in just a sec. Um, here we see more sidebands, so there's our sideband, our center frequency and sidebands. Um, again there's this sort of separation between the two which is equal. And there's our harmonics. And we can see them for a variety of reasons, you know, um, just different types of fault conditions that I'll look at in just a second. So let's have a look at some real cases. Okay, this isn't real, but this is just talking about gears. Under normal circumstances with these two gears turning, I've got a certain vibration because of the two shafts, which I'm not showing here. What I'm showing here is just the gear mesh frequency itself. So it's tooth mesh, tooth mesh, tooth mesh, tooth mesh. And now if we look closely, you can see a little bit of variation in the amplitude but let's just pretend that's not there and just say if the two gears were absolutely perfect not moving in with any eccentricity at all and each tooth mesh was you know the same as the one before it and after it then we would have this nice you know smooth vibration but let's take an exaggerated case um, where if you look at this gear it's moving correctly um, but if you look closely you can see that while the shaft is turning correctly on its axis the gear for whatever reason is moving eccentrically, uh, eccentrically. We may have another situation where the gear isn't moving relative to the shaft but the shaft itself is um, well either eccentric or uh, bent or something like that so either way this gear is actually moving in a circular orbit so at one point in that orbital sort of motion. We are therefore putting more force in the gear mesh. At the opposite part of the cycle uh, there is less force in the gear mesh. Now my animation is really exaggerating that point but as a result we've got our gear mesh frequency but it rises and falls at 
thanks to the eccentric motion, rises and falls. If it's this gear that's uh, eccentric, then the rise and fall, the that that sideband frequency, and that time between the, the cycle that you can see here is related to the turning speed of this pinion. Uh, if, on the other hand, it was this gear that was eccentric and this one was not, then I would see the same sort of shape, except given that this is turning at a lower speed, the rise and fall would be at a lower frequency. So anyway, gear vibration is a classic uh, source of amplitude and frequency modulation. Uh, bearings are also another common source. So let's just take a look at something here. Here I have my my simplified 1x vibration and superimposed on top of that I have um, the vibration due to a fault on the outer race. So this point is damaged and each time one of these rolling elements impacts that point we get a little spike. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the sine wave, the 1x vibration, and just look at the spikes. And I'll just give it a bit more amplitude. So what we're seeing here is that as each rolling element impacts this point here, we get a spike of vibration. You know, this is the ball pass outer race frequency. So it's ping, ping, ping. This little ring down here is the resonance or it's the stress wave. Let's not get into all that for right now. But the fact is that because it's on the outer race and the outer race is not turning, then the force in each impact is the same. On the other hand, if we look at a fault on the inner race, as the damaged area moves through this load zone, the force of the impact is much greater than when it occurs up here. So if we stop it for a second, we get it you know, the impact is occurring in the load zone, out of the load zone, in the load zone, out of the load zone. And therefore, you know, that's when it was in the load zone, out of the load zone, in the load zone, out of the load zone. This is modulation. Now, it doesn't look all pretty and clean like it has before, but instead of a sine wave in here, we have this impact which is occurring according to the ball pass frequency in a race. BPFI because we got the fault on the inner race. So this is our BPFI. We got a ping, ping, ping. We got a little bit of ringing because of resonance or the stress wave or as I say let's not dwell on that. But the amplitude of that signal is rising and falling. Therefore in my spectrum in addition to having a peak at this ball pass or BPFI frequency and in addition to having harmonics of that because it's impacting and that you know, it's not a very smooth source of vibration, we get harmonics, we also expect to see sidebands of the turning speed of the shaft. Because once per revolution of the shaft, uh, we see a rise and fall, because it's once per revolution that this damaged area is going in and out of the load zone. So we see sidebands for that reason. On the other hand, if the damage was on the rolling element itself, well, this is our ball spin frequency. There's just the resonance and shock pulse or whatever, but we got modulation here now. It's, it's at a much lower frequency. And in fact, why don't I just change that setting? so that we can see it a little bit e more easily. So now you can see it's, it's, it's when the cage takes that rolling element out of the load zone, into the load zone, out of the load zone, into the load zone. So I changed the time scale so that we could see it, but out of the load zone, into the load zone, out of the load zone, into the load zone. So there's our ball spin frequency. In actual fact, the way I'm doing this is, is twice ball spin frequency because we, we are impacting on the on the inner race, then the outer race, then the inner race, then the outer race. Um, but, but again, we've got good old amplitude modulation occurring. So we expect to see peaks in the spectrum, but this time the sidebands will be closer together because it's a lower frequency. Okay, so that's the case with bearings. Uh, in the case of electric motors, we can have modulation for a few reasons. One of them is because of broken rotor bars or damaged rotor bars or end rings and so on. And one is because of an eccentric motion of the rotor. Now, 
It's a little bit harder to explain this. I'll just mention a few things and hopefully it's sort of food for thought. When you pass a current, an AC current from a three-phase source through the state of windings, we create a rotating magnetic field. And for a two-pole motor, that rotating magnetic field is either 50 hertz, if that's what country you're from, or 60 hertz. That's what the blue uh, wave is here. It's like the north pole, the south pole, two poles, north, south. That rotating magnetic field induces uh, a current in our rotor and when you induce current in the rotor uh, it also generates a magnetic field that magnetic field uh, sees the spinning rotating magnetic the rotating magnetic field around it and tries to chase it it never quite catches up but if you watch closely you'll see that the rotor is turning more slowly than the magnetic field you see these lines on the rotor are sort of slipping behind that's the slip frequency now imagine if there was a broken rotor bar right where my mouse is on the rotor I'm trying to keep it in the one place what we find is that the ripple of vibration due to that when it's right in the center of this strong magnetic field the forces are greater than when it happens to be at this point so as because of the slip frequency as the broken rotor bar sort of is in the magnetic field versus outside the magnetic field um, well in the strongest part and in the weakest part we get this rise and fall in vibration that's the pole pass frequency uh, it's the slip times the number of poles uh, on the other hand if we had eccentricity you see that the rotor is now moving in a sort of a circular motion so there's one point which is closer to the stator at any point and that also causes modulation you can sort of see it here there's one point the air gap is not uniform around it but it's it's rotating eccentricity and uh, we get modulation it's a little bit harder to visualize it in this case and that's not exactly the point of this little presentation here point is we do get modulation in particular amplitude modulation we can see it in the waveform and we can see it in the spectrum so let's have a look at a couple of real samples of vibration here is vibration from a bearing and what I've tried to illustrate here is uh, you know there it, it's in G's so there's the spike as it's going through the load zone, out of the load zone, into the load zone, out of the load zone, into the load zone, out of the load zone, and so on and so forth. So we get this modulating effect as it goes in and out of the load zone of the bearing. Um, and as a result, we get um, uh, the modulation. We see the sidebands in the spectrum. Um, in this case, and sorry these arrows have gone a bit funny, little technical difficulties that chew up time but anyway in this case we've got uh, uh, damage on this gearbox uh, some eccentricity on both of them uh, a little bent shaft in one case eccentricity in the other case just to simulate this fault and so there's our modulation there's the turning of the lower speed gear the driven gear so there's the modulation 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 as as its teeth sort of go harder in mesh, weaker in mesh, harder in mesh, weaker in mesh and then there's the pinion so the pinion's the smaller gear, in this case it's the output as well uh, so we can see the fluctuations in the time waveform there as well but if we look closely at the spectrum I can clearly see the sidebands as a result and um, so the, the spectrum did give me an indication of this particular fault but um, I can see it in the time waveform too Sometimes you might be surprised that if you look in the log version of your spectrum you'll see sidebands. So in this case, yes it's high amplitude vibration, but you can't really see any sidebands. But when we switch to logarithmic format, lo and behold it's got these little sidebands around each of the peaks. Um, you can see them quite clearly here, the, the sidebands. Uh, you couldn't see them in the linear. In this case, you can see some sidebands in the linear, but in the log, uh, you know, log vertical or amplitude scale, you can see them uh, quite clearly. All these sidebands here. Um, anyway, one of the other uh, points I wanted to make in this quick presentation was how 
beating is often confused with amplitude modulation. In the time waveform they look similar. Um, so let's go back to this situation. What I'm going to do is make this uh, 50 hertz signal. And I'm just going to drop this amplitude down for reasons you'll see in a minute. So here I've got a, a signal of 50 hertz and an amplitude of 5, don't worry about the units, and it looks exactly as we expect. I will add a, an additional source of vibration, you know, I'll give it some frequency, give it some amplitude. Now, uh, right now you, it's what we saw before. Let's do something interesting. Our first signal was 50 hertz with uh, an amplitude of 5. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this one to 50 hertz with an amplitude of 5. And what you see is what you might expect. I've got the two signals adding together. In fact I can show all signals but it's a little bit hard because they're sort of being overwritten by the, the final result. But what you can see here is two signals adding together. So I've got amplitude of 5 for the second one, amplitude of 5 for the first one, so we get an amplitude of 10. But that's because the two signals are in phase with each other. They both had zero phase. What would happen oops, a daisy, if I change the phase of that second signal? Now if I slowly adjust it, what you'll see is that the amplitude appears to be dropping. So we'll, we can keep changing this and when we get to 180 degrees lo and behold we get zero amplitude. Nothing in the spectrum, nothing in the time waveform because what we have are two signals which are 180 degrees out of phase. Now it'll be a bit easier if I actually temporarily dropped the two signal frequencies down and you can see it very clearly here. We've got the green signal rising, falling, rising, falling, the red signal rising, falling, but out of phase with each other, and they cancel each other out. When there is zero phase difference between the two of them, we just wind that back. You, if you look really closely, you'll see these two signals moving sort of relative to each other timing-wise, but when they are in phase with each other, uh, you see that they add together. When they're out of phase, they cancel each other. Now, why did I just tell you that? Because if we just wind that back again and we change the frequency of one of them just by a bit, uh, we start to see this curious thing happen. Um, this blue signal is the combination of my 19 hertz signal and my uh, 20 hertz signal. You can see that here if you look closely at the two raw signals they start off at the same time and right at the same time they look very close in phase to each other and therefore the result is that they add together but because they are different signals you know you, if you keep watching these two you'll see at a certain point they are basically completely out of phase and they cancel so let's go back now to 50 Hertz and Keep doing that, and we'll just make it well 49 hertz, and we'll leave the amplitude the same. But now, um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll make it more of a difference. We see this blue resultant waveform. Now I can turn off those other ones because we understand what beating is now. We see something that looks just like amplitude modulation, but it's not. It's actually two signals going in and out of phase. And look at the spectrum. Even though those waveforms look really similar, if we studied them more closely, you'd see that there is a difference. But notice I've got two peaks in my spectrum, one at 47 hertz and one at 50 hertz. And depending on the relative amplitude, you know, you can see that the rise and fall is different. You know, if they were... Uh, the same amplitude as each other. I forget what I had for this one. Five, of course I did. Um, you know, at this point they add together to be ten. At this point they cancel each other out to be zero. Right at this point, so it just depends on the relative amplitude. But this is the situation, as I say, where we've got two two sources of vibration uh, 
interacting with each other and we get this this beating phenomenon but as a result I've, I've actually got two peaks in the spectrum and if I had resolution that was high enough I would see that there were two peaks those two peaks could be the 2x vibration and twice line frequency it could be other things that uh, that beat together so it's not the same as amplitude modulation even though the waveform looks very similar now last but not least I want to raise this issue or try to clarify the issue of you know we talk about modulation and we talk about demodulation so surely those two things are related aren't they well no actually they're not um, everything we've discussed with modulation is in regard to sources of vibration in a machine that happen to rise and fall in amplitude or vary in frequency as we've discussed so we've got bearings with the inner race going through the load zone rising and falling in that in the source of vibration we get sidebands now yes it's true we can then use demodulation uh, to diagnose that fault um, but for an entirely different reason because let's face it we can have an outer race fault there is no amplitude modulation with an outer race fault but we still use demodulation to detect it so let's see why it is and um, I could use the bearing simulator or this one if I look at this vibration again and let's make it that fault and this one the situation is that in the early early stages of a fault we have this situation where we've got a, a little bit of vibration um, well we've got the 1x vibration and 2x vibration and superimposed on that is just a very little bit of vibration now what I'm displaying here you know, the spikes are way too big than is, in rea is the case in reality so we have an early stage fault there's just a little bit of uh, impact vibration when that little red spot or where the damaged area comes into contact with the rolling elements so here and here. Now in my illustration here, my little simulation, I'm exaggerating that amount of vibration. So the fact is that if we simply took the raw vibration from the accelerometer and looked at it as a time waveform, we may not see it. In fact in the very early stages of a bearing fault we won't see it. If we looked at it in a velocity spectrum we won't see it. There are some other issues at play here related to duty factors and um, um, limitations of the FFT and so on. But we can use some smart technology. Step one of the smart technology is to filter out all that low frequency high amplitude vibration. Now it's potentially a little misleading what I just did then because there are two things kind of going on. There is just a periodic source of vibration, but every time there is an impact here, so every time there's you know, this damage on the inner race or on the outer race, let's not confuse these sources of modulation, every time I get this little ping, there is a sound, ping, I'm waiting for it, ping, waiting for it, ping, and that's something that if the amplitude was higher, we might pick up in a normal spectrum. But every time we get a ping, something else happens inside the machine. Just any time you've got metal to metal contact, you get this stress wave goes whooshing through. Imagine a great big metal bell, and we've got this little metal clacker, whatever those things are called, and we just give the bell a little light tap. We may not hear the bell ring, we may not be able to hear the tap at all, but in actual fact, because of the metal metal contact, we, we can detect the stress wave or the shock pulse that ripples through. If we hit it just a little bit harder, again with all the other sound that's going on, imagine that this bell is surrounded by all this traffic and whatever other, you know, just a lot of confusing noise at sort of lower frequencies, we couldn't possibly hear a person just dinging the, just tapping that bell. However, if that bell rings at a high enough frequency we can filter out all the vibration at a lower frequency than the ringing of the bell so all that high amplitude noise and vibration that's 
sort of distracting us from our analysis of the bearing or the bell. And all we can hear then is not so much the tapping of the bell, but the ringing of the bell or the stress wave that I mentioned. So now we see stress wave, stress wave, or the bell ringing, ringing. And so what we've been left with now is just this waveform. Now what I'm going to do is just increase the amplitude of it so it's a bit easier to see. I've just got ring, ring, ring. Now this is all at a, you know, a higher frequency source of vibration. What we want to do is we want to make it easier to capture this because the stress wave or shock wave or the, the ring could be very short in duration harder to detect. So we go through an enveloping process or a demodulation process. It's the, actually the same sort of process that they use in AM radios to extract the, the sound of the DJ on the radio from the carrier frequency that was used to get it to your radio. So the first step is to rectify the signal, push all the negative stuff positive and then put an envelope around it and then put it through a low pass filter which I can illustrate back here as well so you know we got this sort of the signal we filter out the low frequencies we make all the negative going vibration positive going we envelope it and then when we put it through a low pass filter we end up with something that if we look at it as a time waveform we can see the periodicities so if I um, uh, if I'll just go back to that same point, what I was going to show is, you know, if there's my uh, damage on the outer race of the bearing, that's the time between each ball. Uh, um, uh, impacting that point on the outer race. So, as I go through this process, it ends up giving us a nice time waveform we can look at, or or nice peaks in the spectrum. So it can be confusing. We can say, well, isn't that same? Isn't the signal the same as just the vibration? No, it's not. There's an, a number of reasons, but really, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that, you know, that the bearing resonates, or the sensor resonates, or we can pick up the stress waves. We can use some signal processing to detect those very short duration uh, uh, peaks or, or impacts, whatever you want to call them, and um, and then going through this so-called demodulation process, um, we make them visible in a, in a spectrum or a time waveform. So it's a very effective technique, but as you can see, um, we use demodulation in the case of, you know, outer race faults on bearings where there was no modulation in the first place. It's a coincidence that we've got modulation in the case of inner race faults and we use demodulation to analyze it. They're just two different processes altogether. But what I would tell you is that we can use that process even for gear faults and the broken rotor bars as well. Again, nothing to do with the fact that they actually cause modulation. It's because as those gears impact each other, if they were a bit worn or there was a crack or whatever, they also create this high frequency vibration. So again I can use that enveloping technique to get rid of the low frequency, high amplitude vibration and just focus on what results when you get metal to metal contact. Same with broken rotor bars. Uh, you can see a situation with a broken rotor bar because of the crack that it creates the same stress wave and you may pick that up and there's other situations as well. But it doesn't rely on a modulated signal in the first place, it's just that we're exciting, we're, we're generating stress waves or shock pulses or we're exciting resonances in the accelerometer or the machine itself. Okay, so Amplitude and frequency modulation are common in rotating machinery. We can see the results of particularly amplitude modulation in the waveform and in the spectrum we can see amplitude and frequency modulation quite clearly. Uh, in the case of the spectrum we see it in terms of uh, the sidebands and we can look at how many sidebands and the relative amplitude of the sidebands and how they change over time.
with bearings, or rolling element bearings, gears, electric motors and other components we can see amplitude modulation occur um, because there's a rise and fall in the amplitude of, of a certain source of vibration. There is a difference between the amplitude modulation that I've just talked about and beating and there's a difference between that same uh, modulation that we experience and the demodulation measurement technique. So I hope I have clarified the point, not created any more confusion. You know these presentations I'd love to spend a lot more time on on these things and explain everything in more detail. Um, look all I can say is that's what our training courses are there to do. You know it, it just takes time to really clarify each point but hopefully I've I've made some things clear for you today. So thank you very much for um, viewing this presentation. Just in case you were looking at this through an email link or something like that or via YouTube or something, we've got lots of lots of other presentations uh, both on our website. You can uh, access the presentations. Um, just at the moment you you can join as a free member to my Mobius but in a few months that will go away actually it will be easier to access them but uh, either way there's lots of presentations on lots of topics both on vibration but alignment balancing and the much bigger topic of reliability improvement as well anyway thanks for viewing the presentation I hope you found it interesting <laughs>